that. I know when I was in Leonard, there was a fellow by the name of Eddie. Eddie always loved it when I preached on hell because he said the building's always too cold, and it warmed my soul when you preached about hell. <laughs> and uh, but but we talk about the destinies, heaven and hell. What is it going to be like, or or how are we going to get there? Most likely uh, from uh, uh, the Sermon on the Mount. But this morning, I wanted to take a break from that series for just a moment. And focus upon the upcoming election. You know, in this upcoming election, there are a lot of mixed feelings, I think, in, in, in our hearts about the candidates, about what, what the outcomes are going to be. People are simply afraid. I, I, I saw that uh, the, in, in all the polls that they're taking, the overwhelming majority of Americans are planning to vote against a particular candidate instead of voting for one for whom they're excited about. And I, I think that's true. I've seen that in, in the, my discussions with people privately, uh, that, that they're, they're more interested in, in trying to keep one candidate out of office as opposed to looking at the two and saying, you know, I want this one in office. And that's kind of a sad state of affairs and a sad commentary. And I know uh, in this, this past week, we've, we've started seeing the nice little I voted stickers. And, and uh, with the, the early voting, there's been a, a viral meme that has gone on on the Internet and where people are, are taking these I voted stickers and they're adding little, little sayings after them about how they feel about having voted. And for example, you know, I voted and, and I feel a little sick. And I think that, that a lot of people can say that. Or, or I voted and we all lost. I, I, you know, we look at our country and we're, we're concerned about it. We feel that way. Uh, or I voted and, and a little piece of me died. You can imagine being in the voting booth. Or I, I threw up a little. Or one that kind of brings it a little home. I voted and now I'm seeing a therapist. Actually, that was not the one that was bringing it home to me. I'm not seeing a therapist. I forgot I put this one in there. Uh, I voted, and may God have mercy on my soul. And it's kind of sad. You know, we, we kind of chuckle at those, and they are funny, and we, it's a little bit lighthearted, but this is a, a serious deal. I mean, we're, we're talking about uh, the, the United States of America, an entire country that is, is in consternation about what am I going to do with the vote? There's no secret that people are, are concerned about the election. And a lot of people have simply said, I'm going to sit this one out. It doesn't really matter. I don't, I, I don't, I don't think that it, it, it's going to make that much difference. In fact, I, I hear this a lot. People feel like their single vote will not make a difference in the whole grand scheme of things. You, 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 for example, we've got the Electoral College and, 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 you know, what's my vote? You know, I'm in a state that's predominantly red or I'm in a state that's predominantly blue. and My one vote is not going to matter. And so I'm just going to sit this one out. And there's a lot of people who feel that way. There are others who say that uh, uh, there's not enough difference between the two major candidates. What does it matter if, if the Democrat wins over the Republican or the Republican over the Democrat? They're basically the same. There's no reason to vote because they're basically the same. And I've heard some people say, I can't vote in a good conscience for any of the candidates. They're all scoundrels. They're all liars and cheaters. And that's hard. No, it, 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 that makes it a, a tough election. I think especially for Christians because we understand the responsibility and the duty that we have in all areas and aspects of our lives. And, and we look at the current uh, 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 political scene and the, the, the election that is right upon us. And we look at the candidates and we say, on the one hand, you have this vulgar liar uh, who is a cheater and has failed at several business ventures, abused women, endorsed sexual assault against women, has no successful governmental experience and skirts the law. And then on the other hand, you've got Donald Trump, who is a vulgar liar and is a cheater and has failed in several business dealings and, and, and abused women and endorsed sexual assault and has no successful governmental experience, and he's cursed the law. And we say, what do we do? And it's one of those cases of a lesser of two evils. But you know, for the Christian, it has always been a lesser of two evils, hasn't it? And so some say, why, why would you vote for any evil? I've heard this argument. I, I'm not going to vote for either one of them because I'm not going to vote for any evil. And you just want to ask, have you ever voted in your life? Have all the people that you voted for in the past been Christians on par with Christ with no sin? Well, no. 
Well, instead of sitting it out, maybe we could say that we're going to vote against the greater of two evils. Maybe if you don't want to vote for the lesser of two, vote against the greater of evil. And a Christian can certainly vote against evil by voting for the lesser of two evils. Or if you want to uh, throw in Gary Johnson and Jill Stein, you can say uh, the lesser of four evils. These are what people are looking at and saying, these are the reasons why I'm not going to vote and some of you may say, well, those, those are good reasons, and, and maybe those are. But this morning, I want to look at uh, three other reasons why you shouldn't vote. It's kind of odd, isn't it? But then we're going to look at, despite those, why you should vote. Why I still voted. In fact, I took the opportunity of the early voting to, uh, uh, to go ahead and cast my ballot. Yes, there's some reasons out there that we might think that are good and that that have some weight to them. But in the end, I still voted because I have this opportunity as a citizen of this country to affect the outcome and direction of what we do. I think the first thing is that a lot of people look at the election and say, "Well, well, God is in control. Isn't that a comforting thought that God is in control? When we we look at a time in the nation of Israel, whenever she was supposed to be God's representative to all the nations around her, and yet she had forgotten God. And so God had to reveal himself in other avenues to other peoples and other nations. The book of Daniel is a book that is about God revealing his control to a nation. Unfortunately, it's not just the nation of Israel. It is also the nation of Babylon because other than that, God, or Babylon would not have known God. And so God, he, he reveals himself, for example, in the dream to Nebuchadnezzar or in the vision uh, uh, at, at the fiery furnace. God revealed himself in the handwriting on the wall. The book of Daniel is about God revealing himself to a, a pagan heathen nation. And in chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar has this, this grand dream. And, and he's troubled. It says that his sleep left him. He is the king of Babylon, the world empire. There is no nation on earth as powerful as Babylon. There is no king, no man as powerful as Nebuchadnezzar. And yet he can't get sleep at night because he keeps having this vision of this grand statue. And he decides the best thing to do is go to all the, the, the people, the, the wise men and the, the, the soothsayers, uh, my counsel. They'll know what my dream was. He couldn't even remember the dream. And so he goes and he says, well, well what's the interpretation of my dream? And they didn't know. Well, we, we can't tell you because we don't know what your dream is. If you were truly wise men, if you were truly gifted, he says, you would know what my dream was. And so they couldn't do it. He becomes angry. He decides we're going to kill everyone who calls themselves a wise man or pretends that they can interpret dreams. And Arioch of the captain's guard goes and finds Daniel and his friends and he says, okay, we've got to gather you all up because we're going to put you all to death. And Daniel says, wait, hold on, what's the deal? And, and he says, well, uh, no one could interpret his dreams. So Daniel prays that night to God and God reveals this dream to Daniel. He knows the same dream now that Nebuchadnezzar has. And he reveals to him the answer, the interpretation of that dream. And Daniel begins in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 20 to bless God. He gives this great blessing about God. But he says, blessed be the name of God forever and ever. To whom belongs wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise, knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness, and the light dwells with him. Daniel is extolling God for his greatness, for the power that he has, the wisdom that he holds, and how he shares it with mankind. He communicates those things to man. And among this list of the great things God does, he removes kings and he sets up kings. This was God's point to the people of Babylon. They, they are where they are because of God. Because God is in control. A few chapter late, chapters later in Daniel chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar, you remember, had, had been lifted up with pride. 
And, and God, he has another dream. This one is of the great tree and how it is finally cut down and the, the band is cast around or put around its trunk and, and ultimately it regrows. And Daniel says, this is you. You are going to be so lifted up with pride and power that, that you're going to be cut low. And, and he says that, that in verse 25, he says, you shall be made to eat grass like an ox. You shall be wet with the dew of heavens. Seven periods of time shall pass over you. Until you know that the Most High rules the kingdoms of men and gives it to whom he will. In fact, three times in chapter 4, reference is made that, that Nebuchadnezzar will ultimately come to know that. And finally, at the end of the chapter, uh, he does know that. Remember, he was, he was that moment that he was walking out on his balcony, and he's, he's so proud. Of, Look at my Babylon that I have, I have uh, uh, created, that, uh, that I have built up, and the power that we have. He says, these, these are the things. And he was, it was in that moment that he was, he was cast into a, 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 like an animal into the fields. And when he finally came to himself after the seven times had passed over him, he makes that declaration, the most high rules in the kingdoms of men. God is in control. Psalm 115 and verse 3 he says, our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. He does whatever he wants because he is in control. And when we look at God's history, God uh, has used scoundrels and murderers and, uh, to accomplish his will. I think of, of Jehu, who, who served viciously as a captain under the army of Ahab. He was a vicious man and, and had a bloodlust like no other. And yet God told uh, Elijah, he says, Whenever you, what you need to do is anoint Hosea to be king of Syria. You're going to anoint uh, uh, Jehu to be king uh, of, of Israel. And you're going to anoint Elisha, the son of Shaphat, to be uh, a prophet in your place. And then finally, in, in 2 Kings chapter 9, it comes time for that anointing of Jehu. Elijah's already been taken away. Elisha is now uh, accomplishing what he had left to, to do, and that was the anointing of Jehu. And he tells uh, one of the sons of the prophets, here, take this oil, and you go anoint Jehu to be king. You take this oil, you pour it on his head, and, and uh, 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 tell him, thus says the Lord of hosts, you will be king over Israel. And then, and then he tells the guy, and then get out of there. <laughs> it's like Louis the lightning bug. You know, when the lines are down, don't you hang around. He says, when you anoint that man, get out of his way. You run, flee. It says, flee his presence. Why? Because Jehu was a vicious man. And the first thing, he goes out and, and, and Ahab's dead, but he has like 70 heirs. And he goes and he kills all 70 of Ahab's heirs. While he's on his way, he, he sees Hazael, who is king of Judah. Might as well kill him too. So he kills him. And then he finds out Hazael's got, got children and, and he kills all his kids. Well, this is a vicious man and yet God uses him, one who is a murderer, to, to accomplish his will. Take Nebuchadnezzar, the one we were just speaking of, who, who doesn't even understand the greatness of God, and yet God uses him to punish his own nation. Habakkuk was all concerned, how can you allow this nation that is much worse, much more sinful and immoral than Israel, to punish Israel? I think of Jeremiah Three times in Jeremiah, Jeremiah 25, 9, 27, 6, and 43, 10, three times God refers to Nebuchadnezzar as my servant. God is able to use this man who is filled with pride and bloodlust and power and prejudice, and God uses him as a servant? Yes. In the book of Ezra, in the opening of Ezra, we see Cyrus, the, the good king. He is one of the most recognized, even today, as one of the most benevolent rulers of the ancient world. Because he did allow people like the children of Israel and other nations to return home and serve their gods, rebuild their cities, and rebuild their temples. But he himself was a, 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 a worshiper of Marduk, which was a false god. And yet through Isaiah twice, in Isaiah 44 and 45, God says of Cyrus, he is my minister. 
God is able to use scoundrels like Nero who tormented the church and murdered Christians. And yet God says in those very moments in Romans 13, no government is established except I establish it. He still rules in the kingdoms of men and he still uses his people to change the world. And I think a lot of people knowing that God is in control, some are tempted to say, well, since he's in control, I don't need to vote. But understand this, that, that God uses people to affect his will. Every Christian's vote is how God changes the world. And so I voted. I realized that, and, and so I, I took this opportunity to change the outcome of the world. Yes, by the power of a single vote. Well, some might come and say, well, my citizenship is in heaven. I'm not worried about earthly politics. And it is true that Paul specifically says our citizenship is in heaven and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. So here is Jesus who has the ability to subject all things to himself. And he says, here we are, we're awaiting that moment, looking to heaven. And one of these days, he's coming back. We await a Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we're doing. But Paul doesn't say we're awaiting all that, and then we will be citizens of heaven. He says, right now, while we are waiting, we are citizens of heaven. In the context, Paul had just identified the carnal mindset. He said, their end is their destruction. Their God is their belly. Their glory is their shame. With minds set on earthly things. And, 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 and we might be tempted to say, well, I don't want to be worried about earthly things like a, a, a government election in the United States of America in the year 2016. I don't want to worry about that. I'm, I'm concerned about heaven, heavenly things only. But he says, my citizenship is in heaven. In contrast, Christians have their citizenship. And I love this. The, the word citizenship comes from the Greek word politic. Politics. My politics are in heaven. The understanding and declaration of what is right and what is wrong and what I understand to be right and wrong is in heaven. And everything that we do here is with an eye to there. What I do here today it is, it, I'm concerned about those other things. The job that I have, I, I work my job with an eye to heaven. My family, I raise them with an eye to heaven. My friends that I surround myself with, I, 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 I have friends with an eye to heaven. My education, everything is with an eye to heaven. Everything is weighted by how they will affect heaven for me. And that includes my politics. And so when I say my citizenship is in heaven, I'm saying that Jesus is my king. He's king of kings and lord of lords. Revelation 17 and verse 14. Meaning that he is the superlative king. He's of the highest value king. There is no king like him. And if he is king, then I'm going to follow him first and foremost in my life. Acts 5 verse 29. We ought to obey God rather than men. The human government was, was telling John and Peter, do not preach in the name of Jesus anymore. And he said, look, we, we, you know, we've got to obey God rather than you. We have a higher authority. When I say my citizenship, my politics, my understanding of right and wrong is rooted in heaven, then I'm saying that I'm going to follow God first and foremost. With that being said, that means that the Bible becomes my constitution. My primary constitution. John chapter 12 and verse 48, Jesus says, There's one that is going to judge him on that last day. The words which I have spoken. That becomes my constitution, my guiding light. And once, once I understand that Jesus is my king and I follow God first and foremost, and the Bible is my primary constitution, then of course, yes, I submit to the governments of this land, 1 Peter 3 and verse 12, or, or 2 and verse 13, be subject, to the Lord's, uh, sake, or for, or be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution. Romans 13 we are to obey the government. 
Titus 3, 1. Some say, I'm a citizen of heaven. I don't worry about the politics of men. But even Paul, who wrote those very words that our citizenship is in heaven, used his Roman citizenship, his earthly citizenship, and the, and the rights and the privileges and opportunities that are afforded. He used that to further the gospel. You remember when the Roman guard was asking him, how did you become a Roman citizen? I paid a great price for mine. Paul said, I was free born. He used his citizenship to get out of jail. He used his citizenship to preach the gospel. And so, yes, my citizenship is in heaven, but I still voted. I still voted because it means something. Another reason someone might say I'm not going to vote is because the power is in the gospel. We know that's true. Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. It is rightly observed that the changes needed in our culture will be affected more by evangelism than by voting. We have to understand that as Christians. America's decline is a direct result of moral decline that has spanned generations after generations after generations. Where once God was highly honored, he is now an annoying vestige of the past. Where once good was called good and evil was called evil, now it has become as it did in the days of Isaiah where they were calling good evil and evil good. Where once life was esteemed and hard work was rewarded, now life is cheap and lays is applauded. But that's not just over the past 20 years or 30 years or 40 years. Brethren, that, that decline, that trend has been happening for hundreds of years years or more in our country read the commentary on society from the early 1800s and the mid 1800s and the late 1800s you would think they were writing about society today as they see this moral decline and so uh, the answer to America's ill is is in conversion of the heart a move back to God a return to the old paths this cannot be done at the ballot box. It can only be done at the kitchen table. When we are sitting across from someone with the gospel of Jesus Christ and pleading with them to hate sin and to love God, to know Jesus Christ for them lives, their lives, that's where America is going to be saved. A strong America has been a blessing, not only to her citizens, but to the global community. No nation has spent more time and resources on uh, el eliminating poverty. No nation has, has eliminated racial divides more than America. No nation has allowed the advancement of women more than America. No nation has respect for morality like America does. Brethren, we have to understand that. That doesn't mean we're perfect. I mean, we have failed to meet our own ideals. But no nation has met what we have met. No nation has come to the point that we have come to. And we may lament and wring our hands about all the things we have failed to do. But we have helped the world. Immeasurably, we have helped the world. Why? Why? Because our founding ideals are Christian ideals. And Christianity will help the world everywhere. Now, the further we drift from those Christian ideals, the less we become a blessing, not only to our own citizens, but to the whole world. But the longer we can, we can hold on to those moorings, we may be drifting, but if we can slow the drift, if we can fight the current for just a generation more, lives will be saved. God will be exalted. What makes America strong? Righteousness. 
<laughs> I, I know it seems hackneyed now to say righteousness exalts a nation because Proverbs 14, but it is true. Righteousness is, is what's going to happen. The weakening of America is directly proportional to her, her leaving or slipping away from the righteousness she once had. The swampy mire that we are bogged down in right now is, is a result of the loss of righteousness. And so the closer we draw to God, the stronger we will be as a nation. The best way to make America strong again is through personal work. Evangelism. The Great Commission. You worried about abortion? Change it one heart at a time through evangelism. Concerned about transgenderism? We can solve it one heart at a time through evangelism. The homosexual agenda? We can solve it one heart at a time through evangelism. Poverty, one heart at a time. This is the power of the gospel. And it is the Christian's greatest hope to impact our society. It isn't, it isn't through the presidential candidate. It is through evangelism. And some say, I'd rather be about evangelism than about casting a vote. But those really aren't mutually exclusive. And in the meantime, while we're trying to change hearts and minds through evangelism and the gospel, if, if we can influence the protection of life, the endorsement of morality, through a, a simple civic opportunity to vote in a presidential election, then that's why I still voted. I admit the prospects aren't great, but then politics has never been great. To my knowledge, there's only been one Christian that was ever elected the President of the United States. He was assassinated in four months. We cannot expect non-Christians to act like Christians. We say, well, you know, he's such an immoral person or she's such an immoral person. They're worldly people. They're going to live by worldly ideals. And the further this world or this country drifts away from the church, the more worldly it's going to seem, the more in contrast to the life that we are trying to live as Christians are going to be. And so we're faced with choosing people of the world to lead us in times of trouble. But we can choose to vote against the greater evil. Look, in this election... Three of the candidates, and we'll, we'll use all the ones that will be on your ballot, three of them have promised to continue to fund Planned Parenthood. That is the largest abortion provider in the world. You know, in the United States, in the United States alone, there's a million children aborted every year. A million. When you, when you look at the whole world, that number grows astronomically. And in all the world, there is no provider as large as Planned Parenthood. Three candidates have promised, they absolutely promised, that they will fund, give more funding to Planned Parenthood. And ask yourself this question, where are they getting that funding? Do people that go into the presidency have their own private stash that they fund things like that with? No. They have a public treasury that comes from your private stash. One candidate has promised to defund it. Now, whether or not that candidate is able to accomplish that or not, that may remain to be seen. But let me tell you something. I'd rather go with the unknown than the absolute certainty that it's going to be further funded. Three of the candidates have promised to appoint non-constitutionalist judges. Those are the ones who look at the Constitution and say, well, it's, it doesn't mean what it says. Uh, we'll make up stuff and put it in there. Three of them says, we're going to make sure our judges will make up as much as they can to get our agenda through. One candidate has promised to appoint only constitutionalist judges. What does that matter? This is an appointment for life. And one of the things they're going to be looking at are decisions and laws that come before them, even ones that they've looked at in the past with a possibility of overturning Roe v. Wade. 
which was the floodgate to that million babies a year in our country. So if while we are trying to change the hearts and the minds of Americans about abortion through the preaching and the teaching of the gospel, if while we're doing that, we can save life through a simple vote against such moral evil as abortion, then I'm still going to vote. Let me encourage you to cast your vote. Not just for the President of the United States, but I think in in an even greater election. It's the election for your soul. It has rightly been stated that God has cast a vote for you. That that he wants you to be saved, and he's made everything possible for you to do that. And then on the other side of the aisle, the devil has cast a vote against you to destroy you, to take you down, to make sure that you spend an eternity in hell. And, and this morning, you hold the tie-breaking vote, as it were. You hold the vote to determine where you will spend an eternity. And if you are going to vote for the salvation, then that means you need to respond to God's invitation because only God can save you. And he is looking at you. He knows your heart. He knows you are lost. And he is asking you this morning through the words which I'm speaking, through the, through the gospel that he has prepared for us, he is saying to you, won't you come? Won't you obey? Won't you submit your life? Won't you come and know me? And know the grace that I give. And if this morning maybe God is calling to you and you're hearing that voice for the first time, or maybe it's an echo of the past that you ignored once or twice or a hundred times before, but this morning you're saying, not today. Today I will respond. And you're ready to come in faith, believing in Christ as the only hope for salvation turning away from sins that you've embraced before, hating those garments which are stained with sin even, confessing Him before men as the Son of God and being baptized for the remission of your sins, God God will take that as your vote and add it to His and victory will be yours. If you're ready to make that decision this morning, won't you come while we stand? while we sing.